great day. Hey, can we make some noise right now for our online campus? Yes, so glad that you're worshiping with us. Turn to someone next to you right now, and then we're going to have a little bit more fun. Welcome them. Just turn to them. <laughs> amen, amen. Hey, listen, are you excited about what's going on this morning? Come on. Come on. You guys are, like, loud and energetic and... Jamie, 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 is that the reason you're excited today? Why am I excited? Hold on a second. Spurs it's up. It's okay. like your football team won or something. I, I mean, I it's a good day. Know. It's a good day. Oh. Clemson fans are happy. Gamecock fans are happy. And Davis here with a smile on his face. It's a beautiful thing. Hey. Beautiful thing. 
It's not over, man. It's not over. Y'all have, have a seat real long quick. long season. Goodness. I was going to be humble this morning, but it's all good. Man, we're so excited about what God is doing. He totally messed me up. It's, a, it's great. Are y'all having fun today already? All right. Oh, man. Hey, when you came in this morning, you got your foothills flyer. Make sure you guys check that out. Inside there, there's a connection card. Uh, if you would, take a moment, fill that out. Uh, if you're a first-time guest, though, I want you to hold on to yours because everybody else, you're going to see them dropping their, their connection cards in the buckets on the way out. But I want you to hold on to yours because I want to invite you to the guest room. But before I invite you to the guest room, can we give it up for our first-time guests this morning? Yeah. Amen. And if you are a first-time guest, I, want, I would love to personally invite you to our guest room. When you, when you leave, it'll be to your left. You'll see a lot of people over to the, the left corner. There's a, a room in there. It's our guest room. We'd love to invite you there. we got a free gift for you on your way out the door today. Just to tell you thank you for being here. Some staff, some leaders, volunteers, we're all going to be in there to tell you thank you for being there. I want to meet you. I want to say, hey, give you a high five. Uh, and just let you know it's an honor that you guys came to worship with us in the house today. A uh, couple of announcements for you today. As you can tell, today is our pop-up shop. Do you like the hoodie? Like, it's hoodie weather, y'all. Come on. It's hoodie weather. So make sure if you haven't been able to swing by the pop-up shop, get your stuff today. It's today only. So you want to make sure you guys get that. Uh, very limited quantity. It might not all be there after seconds. So make sure you get your stuff taken care of and you go rep this, be a walking billboard to everybody out there to help people find and follow Jesus. And it's funny how a shirt can spark a conversation. So use that. Next week, October 20th, is our next get. Say get, get. get. In, in the, the game. game. I, y'all said it just like that. That was good. Get in the game next Sunday. You don't want to miss this. This is where it's a, it's a conversation atmosphere so you can get connected to our church. Pastor Greg is there. He gets to tell you, uh, and he has the honor of sharing with you how the church was started, where the church is right now, where the church is going. Because let me tell you something, church. We are moving, and, and God is working. And you get to hear all about that. But also, you get to hear from various ministry leaders about what, uh, how you can get plugged in and you can, you can serve. You'll get to hear about the groups where you can find your community. You can't have community without unity, so you want to make sure you take advantage of that. You also get a free lunch. You, if you have kids, they're taking care for another hour and a half or so for you, so you get another break, which is awesome. Uh, and, and we would love to have you there. If you've been here one week, if you've been here one month, one year, if you've been here the entire time, if you've never been to get in the game, I want to encourage you. because it, it, And here's why. God just gave me this. You get to hear about the church, but you get to discover the true heartbeat of the church. And you don't want to miss that. So I would love for you guys to get registered. You can go to our Connection Center out in the concourse, or you can get registered online, get that taken care of. We'd love to see and hang out with you next week. Also, October 27th is our volunteer appreciation. We want to say thank you. Hey, can we give it up for our volunteers? Let, let's just say, and some of you might be clapping for yourself, and that's all right. Because what we do here cannot be done without you. You are important. You matter. And that's why we're going to have this carnival on Sunday afternoon, October 27th, starting at 5 o'clock. We're going to end at 7. There's all kind of stuff that's going to be there. We've got carnival food. Uh, we've got uh, <laughs> karaoke. Come on, somebody gets to shine. We're going to have giveaways. There's going to be all kinds of different things. But here's what I need you to understand. You don't have to do nothing but show up. Just show up, have fun, jump around, play, enjoy yourself, and let us have the honor of thanking you and showing you how much we appreciate you. It's going to be an honor to serve you. And I want you to understand, too, if you served at Servo Coney, you, you show up. If, if you are interested in serving, you show up. This is for everybody, for us to say thank you, for us to get you plugged in. And if you show up and you're like, you know, I, have, I ain't got my serve spot yet, man, you can even get registered for your serve spot at, at, at the Volunteer Appreciation. We just want to say thank you because we know how important you are in helping people find and follow Jesus. So thank you for that. October 31st is Halloween. Anybody else got their Halloween costume yet? If you have, wow. If you haven't, go with me on October 30th, okay? Like, no, it's... We want to make sure our truck or treat is on October 31st. This is one of the biggest outreaches that we have. Thousands of people come through at Walmart with all the different cars decorated. If you want to get your car registered, you can go online and get that registered. But we need candy. Say candy. candy. 
we need you to help us help the kids stay up all night, okay? So we need to make sure that we're bringing candy. We've already had a lot come in. Thank you for those who have already brought, but we would love for you guys to, to take care of that and, and, and help us reach these kids uh, with the love of Jesus because they get, to, they get to experience Jesus outside the walls, and then when we get them here, they get to experience Jesus inside the walls. Amen? So we need your help with that. We'd love for you to have that. And then on November 3rd, last but not least, God is working. God is moving, and it's time to celebrate again. And it's funny, you're like, we're doing this again? Yes, we are. You know why? Because people keep giving their lives to Jesus. Amen. So excited. So get that taken care of. If you want to take your next steps, register online. When you go out into concourse, go to our Connection Center. Man, they're out there. Go to the pop-up shop, Connection Center, Candy Drop-Off, you name it. But also find somebody, shake their hand, give a hug, and let them know you love them. Church, stand up with me. We're going to pray. We're going to go to a time of worship. God's got something special for us today. And it's so exciting to have you guys in the house. You know, and, and, and we joke about our teams. We joke about football. We joke about sports and, and the wins and the losses. But you know what? The fact that we all woke up this morning, we all have breath in our lungs, our heart is beating, lets me know that we already have victory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for who you are. God, I cannot wait to see what you have in store today. We are here to worship you. God, speak to us loudly and clearly. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen.
Come on. Is God good or what? Man. Hey, Shane, will you just sing that? Let's just sing that bridge. Your name is alive. Let's, let's sing that together. Your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. I believe it. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is a light forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is a light. That the shadows can't deny Your name cannot be overcome Your name is alive Forever lifted high Your name cannot be overcome Amen I'm going to ask our campus hosts, y'all can come on down. We're going to move into our time of giving. And this morning, as you give, there's a couple ways you can give. You can give online at foothills.cc. It's safe and secure. Or you can give as the buckets are being passed around. But we give today because our God is alive. And our God is meeting with us right now. So let's just pray a blessing over this offering. Jesus, this morning... God, as we give, Lord, I pray that you just multiply this offering. We love you, Jesus. We are thankful for the gospel that we can celebrate every single day. God, you are good. It's your name I pray. Amen. Come on and sing this with me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of every signs we could ever bring. Every breath. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Yes, we live for you. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, Lord, we live for you. Come on, sing this with me now. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes.
that we can put all of our trust in you. We can put all our hope in you. And we know that you will meet us right where we are. God, your church is hungry for more of you. And Lord, I pray this morning that you speak to every single one of our hearts in just a mighty, powerful way. God, you are good and worthy of all praise. It's your name I pray. Amen. Have a seat. How you doing after that? That was rich, was it not? Come on, church. We can get excited about that right there. I kind of got all up in my feelings over there, man. I'm just like, Jesus, you're so good. Hey, we're in a series called Cliff Notes, and no, I am not Pastor Greg. He is on his way back. Uh, they went and hung out uh, in Virginia, surprising his mother-in-law for her birthday. They're on their way back now, so if you have a moment today, just pray them up as they travel home. He'll be back next week, but today I am honored to bring the word. We're in this series, Cliff Notes, and what we're doing is we're we're taking things down uh, to, to basically the basics, okay? And and it's a broken down version. You know, and, and since we're in church and I'm bringing the word this morning, I figured I would confess a little bit because when I was in college, I did not like to read. How many of you have your entire life, you've always liked to read? Is, is that you? Okay, that's not me, all right? I, I started liking reading when I got out of school. While I was in school, I did not like reading for some reason. So when these things, when, when I was in college, they're like, hey, have you ever heard of Cliff Notes? I said, mm, no, what's that? So they, you know, we have these Shakespeare books and all these ministerial books and all these, and they're like this thick. They said, well, I got something for you. Come with me to the library. So I went to the library with them, and they brought out books that were this big. I said, praise the Lord. Where have you been all my life? So I was, I was that guy who went and got the Cliff Notes and read those and bypassed the big thick books. But as I started doing this and, and, and reading and stuff like that, I realized that I wasn't getting the whole book or I wasn't getting the whole story because even the cliff notes would leave something out. So all of a sudden, this, this shift in my mind and in my heart said, you know, the Lord was like, Jamie, I'm going to make you a reader. So all of a sudden, I, I wanted to get the whole story and the whole book. I, I put the cliff notes to the side and I started reading the whole story. And church, I'm telling you, if we would read the whole story, we'll see the whole love of Jesus. Amen? So it, 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 got, it got interested. I got very, and now I read all the time. I'm getting older. Er, I said er. I put the ER on there. So now this morning as we, as we dig into this, uh, I want to let you know what we're going to be talking about. But I don't want to let it out yet. Because I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you about Jack and Grace. Jack and Grace are very interesting because when Grace came into Jack's life, Jack got very excited. Jack was like, this is, this is what I've been looking for my entire life. Like, she shows me attention and she's beautiful and I, I outkicked my coverage. He was so excited about Grace. And all of a sudden, as, as he's continuing this, they're about five months into their relationship, and they're inseparable, and they're spending every moment. To, have you met these people before? They're like, every moment together, like, do you have a life outside of that other person? Like, right? So they're sitting there, and, and, and all of a sudden, things start going longer, and they're getting more serious. And now, bypass five, five months, okay? Inseparable, all about it. And, and, and here's what's crazy. Guys, we're really quick to this. You know this. When you get that girl or you get that important thing, you're like, they're the one. That's it. She's the one. Like when I met my wife, she didn't know it, but I told her all the time, you're the one. You just don't know it yet. Listen to the Lord. He'll tell you, okay? Why are you laughing? That's a true story. I won. <laughs> uh, she did too, right? So I got a belly laugh over there. Like, come on. So th this is kind of where they are, but now if you fast forward three years later, it it's getting to a point where Jack's like, hey, you know, y you're, you're the one, but I'm just kind of going with life. Everything's good. He knows that Grace is always going to be there. He knows that Grace is going to show him attention. He knows that Grace is going to be there for his every need, and, and he just kind of, the, the, the spark kind of disappears. So one, one, one afternoon, Grace is like, you know what, I want to I define our relationship. 
So he went to him and was like, hey, you know, I, I, I wanted to find out, like, what, where, where do we stand? And Jack gets very irritated. He gets frustrated. He's like, well, we're together, aren't we? What, what more do you need? And in that moment, Grace realized that he was scared of the commitment. Grace realized, all right, we're three years into this thing, and it's unclear if he'll ever be committed. But you need to know something about this couple. This is not a normal couple because there's millions of Jacks walking around today. And Grace isn't a girl. Grace is the church. See, we come to church, and we, we say we found our church, and, 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 and we love our church, and it's very fun in the beginning, but all of a sudden we get to a routine where all we do is we come and we sit and we leave. See, this morning, church, we're going to take a, a, a cliff note look of why the church is important. We're going to look at why this, this, this whole thing exists, and, and it's very clear in, in, in the Word where God makes it very, very obvious of how important the church is to Him. So we're, we're going to take a look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 32 this morning. And you might be like, where, where is he going? Stick with me, all right? We're going on a trip, and we're going, to, we're going to really look at why the church is important as a whole, but why the church is important to you. See, we, we don't need a bunch of jacks running around being scared of commitment to the church because the church was committed to us when we were born. And I'll explain that in just a minute. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands and everything. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or a wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body but feeds and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So this morning, as we dive into this, I want us to look at several different things. I'm going to give you four things, and this, this passage is going to make sense to you because it's like, no, uh, husbands and wives, I'm not going to tell you how to take care of one another today. I'm going to give you a little tidbit here and there. I'm going to help you out a little bit, but I want you to see the parallel where Paul is writing in Ephesians to the, to the parallel of how God is saying, treat your church. And also, hey, listen, if we get some relationship advice in it at the same time, we're good, right? Following up from last week. So four things I want to give you today on why the church is important. The first one is this. Jesus loves the church. Jesus loves the church. I think this is very obvious. When you step back and you look at verse 25 and 26, he makes it very clear. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ Love the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. But, but love here is so much deeper than what we sit back. Because if you ask me, love is one of the most overused words that there is. We love everything, don't we? I, I, I love that it's raining today. I mean, anybody else miss the rain? Like, hey, there it is, falling from the sky. It is real. I, I, I love, man, I love a good steak dinner. Like, I love... The fact that my team won yesterday. I love the fact that we, we can come into that. I, I love a different things. I love my wife. I love my kids. But there's nothing that I love more than Jesus. And Jesus loves his church. So when you step back and you look at this love here, Paul is using an ancient Greek word here to, to really show us what it looks like. And it's an agape love. But I want to show you the, the four different types of love here, okay? The, Paul chooses one word, but there's four that goes with it. Eros, eros E-R-O-S, it, it's, it's, the, it's the one word for love. It's described, as we might guess from the word itself, erotic love. It refers to a love driven by desire. Husbands, wives, this is, this is where we eros each other, amen? And, and you, you step back and it's like, okay, this is not how God is saying he loves the church here. 
So we take that one and we put it to the side. The other one, and I'm going to butcher this name just for the record, but I'm going to give it my best, okay? Sorge, S-T-O-R-G-E. If you can say it better than me, praise the Lord. I can't. But when you look at this, this word, it's the second word for love here that's given, and, and it refers to the family love, okay? The, the family, I mean, it's the kind of love there's between a parent and a child, between family members in general. It's a, it's a love driven by blood. How many of you are parents in here? How many of you are parents? You'll do anything for your kids, will you not? How many of you have those kids that are not really your blood, but they're your kids? You know what I'm saying? Like, we will do anything for our family. Family takes care of family. And this is the love that he's talking about here. But this is still not the love that Paul is referring to that Jesus has for his church. So let's take that one and set it to the side. The next one is philia. P-H-I-L-I-A. It's the third word for love. And it speaks of a brotherly friendship and affection. It's the love of deep friendship and deep partnership. It might be described as the highest love of which man without God's help is capable of. It also is driven by common interest or common affection. We all have those friends that are close to us. They're our best friends. Then we bypass calling them our friend and we call them brother or we call them sister. This is the kind of love that he's saying here. And still not to the level where Jesus loves his church. So we take that one and set it to the side. But then we get to the word, agape. Agape. It's the fourth word for love. And these other three, they speak about love that is felt. Like you feel this. This is totally different because this is described as an instinctive love. This is a love that comes spontaneously from the heart. Paul here, what I love, he assumes that these other three are present But Christians should not act as these things do, not matter in their marriage relationship. This is how he's going. He's showing the importance of how all four of these are very important. These first three are very important in the marriage relationship. But when you take a step back and you look at how we are to be married to the church and how Jesus, we're the bridegroom. And you step back and it's like, okay, these other things matter. They do. But Paul's first point is to address the higher love, the agape love, because it describes the different kind of love. It's a love that's more than a decision. A decision, Like, you know, we decide to love different things, and we also decide not to love different things, right? When I'm traveling down the road, I decide to love the fast lane, the left side of the lane. I do not desire to love the ones who are going slow in the left side of the fast lane. Amen. If that's you, I'll love you from a distance. Rear view mirror, let's go, right? I I choose to, to, to love and I choose not to love, but is that biblical? Is that biblical? Should we be choosing to and not to? I don't see in, in, in Scripture where Jesus chooses to love us on a good day compared to a bad day. He chooses to love us every day, right? So is it biblical for us to choose to love and not to love? No, God says we're to love. And this is why Jesus agapes his church. All right, you ready? This is why he agapes his church. This is why he loves his church. Because it is a love that loves without changing. Here, here, here's, what, here's what blows my mind about Jesus. No matter what I do on my best day, my worst day, he loves me the same. There's nothing I can do to make God love me less, and there's nothing I can do to make God love me more. God is love. It is not what he does. It is who he is. So when I step back, he, his love does not change. It's an agape love. Also, it's a a self-giving love. It it, it loves and it gives without demanding or expecting some kind of payback. I'm going to love you, but I need you to do this for me. That's not what he does. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus loves his church and doesn't expect anything back. It's a love so great that it can, can be given to the unlovable or the unappealing. It's a love with no strings attached. You, you've heard me say it before. The church is a hospital for the broken, not a museum for the good. We want people to walk in broken so they can feel the healing and restoration of Jesus and walk out healed. We don't want them walking in and be like, well, they look like they got all together. Because let me tell you something. Out here, we look like it, but inside, we ain't got nothing together. Because we can make people think what we want them to think. Man, it's a hospital for the broken, not a museum for the good. Jesus Loves his church, and agape love gives and loves because it wants to. 
It doesn't do it out of demand or, or expect payment. It gives because, because it loves. So the first one, Jesus loves his church. That's why church is important. You step back and you look at scripture. I go back to, to verse 25. Just as Christ loved the church, he gave up his life for her. God sent his son. He didn't have to. He chose to. Knowing that some people wouldn't receive that. But he did it anyways. The second one, Jesus, the church is the place where God grows us. The church is where the place where God grows us. And I, I think this is very interesting here because when you step back and you look at verse 27 and 29, it says, He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who, does, who loves his wife actually shows love to himself. Verse 29 kind of makes me chuckle. No one hates his own body, but feeds. Amen? Feed. How many of you ready for Sunday afternoon lunch already? Come on. Feeds and cares for it. I, I think it's interesting that he says that, but then he follows up just as Christ cares for the church. It grows us. It grows us. Some of us in here, we've read our Bible all week long. We've had, we've had church in our house. We've had church in our car. But for some of us in here, this is the only time you do church. So when you come in here, this is your opportunity to get fed. This is your opportunity to, to get what you need for the week. This is your pick-me-up. But this is not where it stops. Church is like the, the pep rally where we come in and we get what we need and we walk out of here because church, if all we do is get what we need in here and we don't take it out there, somebody is missing out on something important. Just like if, I, if, if you put seeds in the ground and you don't water it, is it going to grow? No. No. You got, you got to put, you got to water it. You got to fertilize it. You got to do everything you got to do to get that thing to grow. What are you doing to help yourself grow? That's why the church is important. The church is used to help us grow. I believe the most important thing in, that, that we can do is, is how we treat each other. How we treat each other. Growth brings happiness and joy. See, when you look at this, and, and let's go back to the marriage analogy, because in a marriage, the spouse's main job is to make the other one happy. Say happy. Some of y'all like, well, they missed that one yesterday, Pastor. Like, they, you know, don't be that way. I know, I know the love language of my spouse, okay? I know what makes her happy and what doesn't. I don't always choose what makes her happy because the trash stays in the kitchen just a little extra day, okay? Like, but I know, and here's what's crazy. I know when she comes home and the trash has been taken out, and, and I, didn't, I don't have to clean the house altogether, but if I, like, pick up my mess and the kid's mess, I man, she walks in thinking nothing happened, and all of a sudden she starts walking out, she starts to smile, I'm talking about you. She starts to smile. And she's like, you didn't sit around and do nothing all day. I'm like, nope. But then here's what's crazy. That brings her happiness, and then I forget it the next week because we don't always choose the happy route. We, we, we need to, to, to look and do what makes the other happy. So what in, the, in this marriage bond with the church and you? You know what makes the church happy? You know what makes God happy? When you serve. When you worship, when you pray, when you dig in your word, when you love others just as you love yourself, after you love God first. I mean, I could go on it. When you, when you hold a door for somebody, when you extend happiness, that makes the church happy. See, we're, we're here to, to, to make each other happy, but then take, take it a step further. You commit yourself to the happiness of your husband and your wife. I'll never forget the, the, when, I, when I got married, you know, you talk about, you know, better for worse, the death of your part, and, and all happiness is in there. And now that I'm doing weddings, it's funny, I stand there and I, we do the vow thing and they got these big old smiles on their face. And I lean over, I'm like, you need to mean this in five years as well, not just today. Because it's easy to make a vow in the beginning, but it's harder to hold on to that vow. When you accept Jesus into your life and you accept the, you, and you serve and you worship and you pray, you do that's a hard vow to hold on to that you got to hold on to. Yes, Father. God, I want, I, I want to give my life to you. I want to build my life today, but maybe not next week. We don't pick and choose. 
We don't, we, don't, we don't pick and choose. Paul here is telling, in verse 27, 29, he's telling husbands and wives in Scripture, wives, commit yourself to your husband, and husband, commit yourself to your church, but just as Christ commits himself to the church, Jesus gave everything for the church, for his bride, for the one that he loves. And if we say we love Jesus, then we sh- he should be the center of our life, right? I, I, I look at it this way. Uh, how many of you had hobbies growing up? You ever had hobbies? Like, I had hobbies growing up, and, and what's funny is a hobby will not last your entire life. When I was growing up, I loved model cars. I had patience then, okay? Now, if you say, hey, put this together with the glue and stuff, nah, man, give me Legos. It snaps on. We're good, all right? Because when I was growing up, Legos was a hobby. Drawing was a hobby. Well, then life gets busy, things change. Those hobbies kind of get put to the side. The hobbies change a little bit. Now, all right, I have two boys who love Legos. Guess what? Let's pick the hobby back up. I've got two boys who love to draw. Pick the hobby back up. I, it, it's funny how hobbies will come and they will go. Kind of like we and look at the church as a hobby. We come and we go. See, Jesus did not mean for his church to be a hobby. He meant for his church to be an investment. Let me, let me give you the definition of investment. I, I sat down last night and I ain't going to lie. I didn't cliff note it. I Googled it. Come on, right? Cliff notes have evolved. It's called Google. So I looked and I said, what, what's the investment definition? It said, you know, get this. It's an act of devoting time, effort, or energy to a particular undertaking with the expectation of a worthwhile result. Let me read that one more time. It's the act of devoting time, effort, or energy to a particular undertaking with the expectation of a worthwhile result. Why would you not look at church as an investment? You come in, you you devote your time to it. You sit back and, and you give your effort and you know that some worthwhile result's about to happen. Your worship this morning was an investment. It was incredible. And I'm telling you, Jesus was smiling down. He's like, that's my church. That's my people. That's who I died for. That's who I love. And it's growth. It's growth. But church, we need to understand that he's still doing his part. He died for the church, and he continues to empower the church. He gives us what we need. He teaches us. He loves us. The church is the part, is to make Jesus happy. And we do that through growing together and serving him through the church. Do you think that Jesus was happy with his bride on Servo Coney? Do you think Jesus was happy? Absolutely. There are people still wearing the shirts and people are still asking questions. Jesus was happy with his bride. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 23, it says this, And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with himself. The church, which is his body. If Jesus is the head, then the community of Christians make up his body. And the idea of the fullness of him here is probably connected to the the manner in which Jesus fills his church with his presence and his blessings. Do you realize worship was just as good at 810 this morning when the room was empty as it was with you here? You don't know why? Because Jesus was here then, and Jesus is here now, and Jesus will be here next week, and the next week, and the next week. He comes and gives us what we need, so we got to take it in. That's what helps us grow. I stopped reading the cliff note, and I started reading the real book, and I got the real stuff. I was like, oh, that wasn't in the cliff, because then I would take the cliff note and the book, and I would look, okay, which one's which? And I was seeing, man, they're leaving a lot of stuff out. Church. The reason why we're doing this series is so you will dig and you don't miss something. There's so much more that I want to give you this morning that I ain't got time for. But you got time when you make it an investment and not a hobby. The third one is this. The church is the place where God encourages us. God encourages here. I I love when you guys walk in the door, man. It's like you walking in the parking lot because trust me, I'm married. I have kids. I have life. When you walk in the parking lot, the smile's not on the face all the time, is it? Isn't it funny, statistics show that the, 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 the most arguments and the craziest arguments between a husband and wife are on Sunday morning when the kids are getting ready and you're trying to get to church. 
How many of you ever argued on the way to church? No, you didn't have to be honest. Put your hands down. Hands down. I feel you. But then when you get in the parking lot and you see all these people standing at the doors, we got some of the best greeters in the world. They're like, hey, how you doing? You can't help but be happy back. You don't, you don't know how far an encouraging word will go. And if we, if we understand that Jesus loves his church, and if we understand that while we're here, the church grows us, guess what? God's going to put the right people at the right place to encourage you while you're in his house. That's what I love. 31 and 32 of Ephesians 5. Go back there. It says this. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined with, to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. I want to encourage you this morning, and here's here's what I want you to hear based off of these two scriptures. When I look at these two scriptures and I see that Christ and the church are one, this shows me, yes, the church is the place where God encourages us because it shows us that Jesus wants more than just an external surface relationship. He wants more. There's a lot of relationships that are surface level. How, where does that get you? Hurt and pain, right? When, when you go into a deeper relationship with Jesus, it's not a surface level. That means you're getting his blessings and you're giving blessings back to him. I'm not in it just so God will bless me. I want to bless God just as much, if not more, because I want to build my life on him. I want to, I want to do everything that I can to make him happy, to make him feel honored, to make him feel glory. It also shows us that Jesus wants us to be one with him. He wants us to be one with him, and it shows us that there's a a sense in which Jesus is kind of incomplete without us. How many of you ever come to church on a Sunday morning, and you're looking for somebody that you hadn't seen all week, but you know church is where they're going to be, and then when they're not here, you miss them, right? You shoot that text, hey, where you at? I missed you today, all those kind of different things. You realize when you don't show up, Jesus is incomplete without you. He misses you. He, he, he yearns for time with you. He yearns a relationship with you. He yearns for you to see how important this bond is. And we want encouragement, but let's go to the one who can encourage us. Because I, I, verse 32 makes it very clear. Christ and the church are one. One. And then the the fourth one, the church is the place where God uses us best, where God uses us best. This one might seem a little tricky. It might seem a little tricky. I want to go over to Matthew 28, 18 through 20, okay? And and you know this. This This is where Jesus is having his last charge, his last challenge to his disciples. And, and he makes instructions very clear. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all these commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Look at that. I am with you always. See, when we choose to follow him and we choose to to buy into this church thing and God begins to use us, do you realize you are not by yourself? Just as he was with his disciples then, he's with his disciples and followers now. We are not alone in this thing. And I think sometimes we feel like we are. Jesus tells him, like, look, go tell him about me. Teach him about me. And watch what happens. The church is the tool that God created to accomplish this this right here. How how do we go and make? How do we teach them? Well, you got to come here and let God grow you. You come to church and let God encourage you. Then all of a sudden you come to church and and, and you you just let God use you in all sorts of ways. Walk into the children's area and see how God's using those leaders to influence your children. Come on a Wednesday night and and look at how those leaders are influencing our students. Look at the the campus hosts and the greeters and look how they're influencing us. Look at the the greeters at the door. It's raining, the umbrella holders. How many of you are excited that somebody came to you with an umbrella this morning? Like, that's awesome. Some of y'all are like, yay, me. I feel you. 
My hair was getting wet. You're welcome. <laughs> I mean, look, look at, but, but, but you know why God uses us best? Because we called on to something that he did. He sacrificed his son, and we sacrifice ourselves. When we make the sacrifice, we take those risks so we can receive the blessings. God wants us to win. He wants us to say, we do not walk in defeat. We walk in victory all because Jesus said, I'm going to send my son to die for my church. That's how important my church is. The church is the tool. I want to kind of wrap it up this way this morning. I want you to, to see something. Jesus gave everything for his church. Let, let's, let's flip over to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 and 25. Oh, this is so good. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his what? His promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not, get this, neglect our meeting together. Let's not let, neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. In Hebrews, God tells us that we are to share with others the love of him and that, that we are to think of ways to motivate each other and to perform acts of love and good works in the name of Jesus. And we do that through church. Church, we, <laughs> we are imperfect people chasing after a perfect God. And when you step back and you look at this, the perfect church, it's in heaven. It's not, it's not here on earth. It, 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 it's not. We'll see the perfect church when we get there. But even with all of its human flaws, the church is still the bride of Christ. The church is what and who Jesus died for. I'm not always going to get it right in our marriage. But it's not going to stop me from fighting and working hard at it. Because there's a, there's a bond. There's a commitment. Man, where is your bond and your commitment to his church? I uh, thought about something over the last couple of days and kind of close it out with this. And the church, his people, because let me break it down for you. If you were not here, if none of us were here, if the lights were off and everything was locked up, this is just a building. Church, I'm telling you this morning why you're important. Because you have the Father. You have the tools. You have the ability to help someone else grow in their walk with Christ. You have the, the words to be able to encourage someone when they need encouragement. You have the ability to be used by the Father. You have the ability to love this as well. So building empty, this is just a building. But when we show up, this is church. And God has given us a responsibility. He's given us an opportunity to, to show his love and to show his grace and to show his compassion and to show his mercy. And I want to, I want to try to do something here real quick. I'm Doing something on the spur of the moment, but it is, it's okay. I'll ask for forgiveness later. Drew, I'm going to need your help, just for the record. But if you could, just turn off all the lights and just have one light right here. And if you're scared of the dark, it'll be okay. But I, I want you to see the importance. Because church, a lot of times, we miss the opportunity that God has given us to, to really Show him. And see, if, 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 if there's just one spotlight right here, everybody knows that this is what you see. But church, I don't want to be in the spotlight. But I am. <laughs> what I love about this is this is kind of people's view of the church. They see us. But in reality, it's our responsibility to step into the shadows 
and to be able to put Jesus on display. See, there's something special when all they see is him. There's something special when we remove ourselves from the equation. Because, church, I'll be honest with you, there's going to be days where we walk into the spotlight and people are going to see us. But don't let them see you. Let them see him. Put him on display. Put him in the spotlight. Remove yourself. And watch what happens. Because what we don't realize is this. People are hurting around us. People need an answer. People need something to fill the void. And we've got what they need. Why are we so quiet about the thing that matters, but we'll run our mouth about everything else? Their stadium's filled and people are cheering. They're putting boys in jerseys on a pedestal and we can't even put Jesus on the throne. Why? Why? Church, you want to know why the church is important? Because there's people dying and going to hell around us all day. And God has given us the tools and the ability because God and the church are one. One. Man, I don't, I don't want the spotlight. It's much better when they see Jesus. It's much better when they don't see us. What would the church look like if we're so passionate about the Father? Because I'm telling you, when we get to heaven, that church is going to be something else. But we don't have to wait to get there to experience that when we can experience that right here, right now. So I'm going to ask Dave to come on out. You, you guys, you can turn the lights back up. I'm going to ask Dave to come on out. And I want us to, to take a moment and put Jesus on display. And it's going to go a little something like this. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes. And Come on, put them on display. Come on. And show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those. Let's sing that holy. Oh, holy. none peace open up my eyes and wander and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those come on church sing it out holy That's how we were going to finish, but I, I can't. If everybody would, just bow your head, close your eyes this morning. Some of you in here, you can't put Jesus on display because you don't have him to display yet. And, man, if you're in here and you've got a void, man, I, I want to offer you the opportunity to have that void filled. You in here, you may be like, you know what, I need Jesus in my life. Just pray this in your heart right now. Father God, I come to you now. I need you. I'm broken and I'm hurting. And God, I need you to come into my life. Father, I admit that I've messed up and I've made mistakes. But that's not me when I'm with you. So, Father, I believe that you died for me, that you rose again. Father, come into my life. I confess that I need you now more than ever. Come into my life. Be a display on my heart so I can put you on display to those who need you just as I 
needed you. God, I'm giving my life to you right here, right now. With heads bowed, eyes closed. If you prayed that prayer, would you just, I want to pray over you. Would you just slip your hand, slip your hand up real quick for me. I see you. I see you. Wow, I see you. I see you. You can put your hands down. Amen. Hands, wow. God, you're so good. Father, you're on display. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for those who said, I'm taking a step today and give my life to you. Father, I pray that you give them strength and courage, and Father, that you let them know that they matter to you. And God, I pray now that they will put you on display because you matter to them. Father, we love you, and we praise you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, have you enjoyed today? It's been a good day. Amen. It's been a good day. Listen, check out the pop-up shop, man. What, what do you say? Go BG. Go put them on display, church. Go put them on display. We'll see you next Sunday. Never cease to praise, even when I stand before.